I am going to start kicking this thing off. So let me introduce our speaker. David O. Smith is a distinguished fellow with the South Asia program at the Stimson Center, a nonpartisan research center in Washington, D.C. He retired from government service in 2012 after serving, serving as a senior executive in the Defense Intelligence Agency. Before that, he was a senior country director for Pakistan in the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. During his 31 years of service in the U.S. Army, he served in a wide variety of artillery uh, positions uh, and spent uh, 22 years dealing with political military issues in the Near East and South Asia. In addition to several scholarly articles and book chapters about Pakistan and South Asia, he's the author of The Quetta Experience, A Study in Attitudes and Values Within the Pakistani Army, published by the Woodfoot Woodrow Wilson Center in 2018. Uh, and also The Wellington Experience, a study in attitudes and values within the Indian Army published by the Stimson Center in 2020. David, we probably have to have you talk about both of those books. They probably sound fascinating and, and uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, myopics on, on those two areas. But uh, David, welcome to tonight's broadcast. Thank you very much, Tom, for having me. And it's a pleasure to talk to uh, members of the Army Navy Club, a place where in the course of my career, I've spent a lot of time and had a lot of good food and uh, met a lot of very nice people. Uh, let me start talking about my book. Uh, and by way of introduction, let me just do this. Uh, I'll, okay. Is it up there, David? Uh, yeah, can you take it down for right now? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, in December of 1783, in one of his last acts as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, George Washington sent a list of 16 officers to Congress, which was then meeting in Annapolis, Maryland. He had long been urging uh, Congress to raise a small peacetime military establishment for the new country, and he wished before he resigned his commission to recommend who should be serving in it. And he wrote this in that letter. In addition to the testimony which accompanies them, I can only add mine that most of the gentlemen whose names are on the list are personally known to me as some of the best officers who were in the army. So included in that list of 16 names were James and John Armstrong of Northumberland County, Pennsylvania. So the question arises, who were they and what had they done to make Washington's list? Both men joined the Continental Army in 1776 and served to the very end in 1783. They had a younger brother, Hamilton, who remained home to work on the family farm, uh, but later he established his own credentials as an Indian fighter on the Pennsylvania frontier, an experience that was frequently more arduous and dangerous than that of his two older brothers. <clears throat> All three of these men were the undistinguished sons of a yeoman farmer scraping out a very meager living on the Pennsylvania frontier. All three were soldiers of the revolution and became officers in the first U.S. Army that was organized afterward. So this book is their story. It is not intended to be a comprehensive history of the American Revolution. It simply tells the story of three brothers who answered the call to arms and describes what they saw and did during their service in the Continental Army and in the militia units that defended the frontier. So let's now go to the first slide. Okay, it all begins with this miniature portrait, which is only about maybe two inches by three inches. It was hanging on the, uh, on the wall of my in-law's house, and I first noticed it when I married my daughter, or my daughter, when I married my uh, wife so many years ago. So I asked who it was, and they said, well, this is our ancestor, John Armstrong. This, by the way, is the only known likeness of any of the three Armstrong brothers. The medal that he's wearing is the uh, insignia of the Society of the Cincinnati, a veterans group that was founded after the revolution by officers who had served at least three years in the Continental Army. But John Armstrong uh, was known for being an officer in the first regiment of the U.S. Army that was raised in 1784. He fought Indians in the Northwest Territory. He was almost killed in one of the major battles there. He was selected to uh, lead a covert expedition up the Missouri River in 1790, uh, preceding Lewis and Clark at a time when uh, the uh, 
territory was owned by the Spanish crown. After leaving the army, he became a prominent figure in Ohio and Indiana as a merchant and a land speculator and a member of the state militias. So when my wife retired, she decided that as a retirement project, she wanted to write a story about his life. She knew a lot about his life after the revolution because he left a lot of papers in the Indiana State Historical Society in Indianapolis, but she knew nothing about what he did in the revolution because uh, I'm an army guy and because I have an affinity for military history, she asked me if I would do that chapter in her book. And I, of course, readily agreed. Now, an outline of what Armstrong had done in the revolution was pretty easy to find because uh, his service record is on the Pennsylvania Society of Cincinnati website. But he left only a few letters of his time in the revolution and no diaries or journals survived. So I decided early on I would have to follow his military career in the revolution uh, through the story of the units and the regiments that he served with and by using letters, diaries, and journals from other Pennsylvania officers who lived and fought side by side with him during those war years. Now I discovered two things right off the bat when I did my research. I quickly discovered that he had two brothers that had also fought in the revolution. But my wife knew nothing about them, no, nor did anyone in her family because they were not in the family's line of descent. Um, I also realized that the experience of the three brothers encompassed almost the totality of the revolution. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see what I mean. You can look at their combined war service and the battles that they fought in. The only major battle that they're really missing is Saratoga and first Trenton. So this book is their story. Next slide. This is the book. Uh, the publisher is, uh, is Ex Libris, but it's also available in three formats at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and many other websites that, uh, that sell books. Um, it has 14 chapters, and I'm gonna just show you what, the, what they are. Next slide. Two chapters of particular interest, uh, well, at least one chapter of the local interest may be chapter 12, which is about John Armstrong and victory in, in Virginia. Now this covers the Yorktown campaign, but it really begins in January of 1781 with the invasion of Virginia by the newest Brigadier General in the British Army, a man named Benedict Arnold, who was fresh from attempting to sell out West Point only a few months earlier. And I also want to draw everybody's attention to chapter 13, uh, which covers the two-year period after Yorktown. Of course, we all learned that the revolution was over at Yorktown, only it went on for nearly, for, for more than two years afterward. It's a period that's glossed over in many histories of the revolution, uh, but I found it particularly fascinating. So what I propose to do with the rest of the time allotted to me here is to briefly describe the careers of each Armstrong brother and provide one vignette from the book uh, that illustrates the kind of person each man was. And after that, I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. So next slide, please. We're gonna start here with James Armstrong. And that's the uniform that he wore when he was a member of Lee's Legion as a Lieutenant or Captain commanding a cavalry troop. But you can see on the slide, he enlists in 1776 early, at the beginning of that year, as a private in the 2nd Pennsylvania Battalion. But almost immediately within the first four weeks that he's associated with the battalion, he's plucked out of the ranks and made the battalion quartermaster. And he later, uh, about a few months after that, gets commissioned as an ensign and subsequently promoted to a, a lieutenant in that regiment. You can see the battles that he participated in, the invasion of Canada, the retreat from Canada, the defense of Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, the second Pennsylvania Battalion becomes the third Pennsylvania Regiment after a year. It's mustered out and then mustered right back in. And you can see the battles that he serves in there. 
And then in late 1779, or very early in 1780, he leaves the regiment and becomes a member of Lee's Legion. Now, a legion is a, uh, a mixed unit that combines uh, infantry and cavalry. And he becomes a captain commanding one of three cavalry troops within the legion. Participates in several battles in the north. And in early 1781, Lee's Legion goes south to uh, bolster General Nathaniel Green and participates in all of the major battles uh, in the Southern Department. You'll note at the end that uh, he was captured by the British in December of 1781, but was exchanged a few months later and continued to serve through the end of the war. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, bear with me here. This is a quirky quote that I have, and I'll explain what it means a little bit later on. Uh, Quinby Bridge is located just north of Charleston in Berkeley County, South Carolina. It's uh, east of the Cooper River, and if you look in the lower right hand of the map, you will see a sign pointing with an arrow to exactly where Quinby's Bridge is. Uh, Light Horse Henry Lee is uh, the man at the uh, bottom of the slide on the left, and Brigadier General Thomas Sumter of the South Carolina Militia is the gentleman on the right. Okay, so let's talk about Horatius at the bridge. I'll set the, uh, I'll set the uh, context for you. After a Pyrrhic victory at uh, in Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina, uh, Lord Wallace, who was commanding all the British troops in South Carolina, departed the state for Virginia, thinking the fighting would be better there. And we all know what happened to him. Uh, and after that, the British detachments in the interior of the state started moving to consolidate themselves in the port of Charleston. General Nathaniel Green assigned Lee's legion the task of supporting Sumter, and their task was to prevent a British regiment, the 19th Regiment of Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Coates, from reaching Charleston. Coates was commanding 600 men in a British regiment, plus 150 mounted loyalists, and he had one cannon, which plays a, a, a unique role in the, uh, in the battle that unfolds. Sumter had 1,000 militia, and then, of course, the 300 men of Lee's Legion. Coates was desperately trying to escape Lee, first by getting across the Cooper River, and then secondly by getting across Quimby Bridge, which was impassable except for a single bridge. On the 17th of July in 1781, Lee caught up and annihilated 100 men of Coates' rear detachment about three miles before Quimby Bridge. He then sent Armstrong's cavalry troop forward to find the rest of the regiment. Now, when Armstrong got on the scene, he was surprised to find that Coates was already over the creek, that a cannon was being situated to fire down the bridge, and that the bridge was in the process of being dismantled by British engineers. Uh, and by this, I mean they were loosening the planks so that when the rear detachment came across, they could just throw them in the creek and it would create a gap that nobody could pass. He had not yet realized that his rear detachment had been captured. So Armstrong knew that Lee did not know that he was across the bridge, so he sent back a messenger to tell Lee about this. And the messenger garbled the message, the friction of war. And Lee thought Armstrong was asking for instructions, and he sent back a sharply worded reply that said, Captain Armstrong knows that the standing order of the Legion is to attack the British without any delay, regardless of the situation. So stung by this uh, implied rebuke, Armstrong spurs his horse and gallops over the partially dismantled bridge with the leading troop, or the leading section of his troop. Seeing the charge, the British engineers start desperately throwing the planks into the creek, uh, but Armstrong has attacked them with such degree of surprise that he's able to easily uh, jump the gap with his, uh, with his first section. Second section comes up, led by Lieutenant George Carrington. Uh, by this time, the gap is a little larger. 
only two or three of those horses and Carrington make the leap. The rest of the horses stopped and refused to make the leap. So basically what we have is Armstrong and not more than a dozen soldiers charging an entire British regiment. The cannon is being sighted by uh, Colonel Coates himself. And when Armstrong approaches the cannon, he's taken them by surprise, they can't fire. The crew deserts the cannon. Armstrong and Coates are actually fighting sword to sword over the caisson at the rear of the cannon, while the remaining 11 men or so charge the rest of the British regiment. <clears throat> A British officer that was on the scene said, this was the most daring thing I ever saw. Eventually, the British realized, even though they were running away, realized that there were only a dozen men attacking them, and they began to regroup and fight back. By this time, Lee and the rest of the Legion are on the scene, but all they can do is watch helplessly across uh, Quinby Creek, while Armstrong's men slowly but inexorably are getting cut to pieces by the regiment. Finally, Armstrong and Carrington realize the futility of their position and they gather what survivors they can and ride off to find a place upstream where they can cross and rejoin Lee. Armstrong's charge over Quinby Bridge was arguably the single bravest act of valor witnessed by anyone in Green's Southern campaign. Had the award existed at the time, which it did not, there were no Valor Awards at that time in the Continental Army, Armstrong almost certainly would have been nominated for the Medal of Honor. A 19th century historian named William Johnson referred to Armstrong in his writing as the American Cocles, and that brings us back to Horatius at the Bridge. This is a reference to a Roman named Publius Horatius Cocles. Horatius at the bridge in 6th century BC Rome, who was immortalized in uh, Macaulay's uh, well-known poem. One of uh, an extract of theirs on the screen. He writes in this book, however, history does not record an instance of more absolute self-devotion than was displayed on this occasion. Sumter was also on the scene and he wrote to Green, quote, the charge made by the gallant Captain Armstrong of Colonel Lee's Corps, said to be on the rear of the enemy, is somewhat erroneous, whereas it was through their whole line of march. This adroit exploit needs no coloring. Had the whole of the cavalry gone through with its charge, it's most probable they would have captured the enemy. Green singled Armstrong out for praise in his general orders, and he wrote letters to Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette in Virginia, who was his rear detachment commander, and to the president of the Continental Congress. And to the latter, he said this, nothing can equal the gallantry of this troop. And had the enemy been overtaken in any other position, the cavalry in all probability would have taken the whole party. This is only one example of the bravery that James Armstrong displayed throughout the entire Southern campaign. Let's now move on to John Armstrong. John Armstrong also enlists in the Continental Army in 1776 as a private, this in the 12th Pennsylvania Regiment. He's immediately promoted to become a sergeant and eventually is commissioned as an ensign and promoted to lieutenant. His battles are there on the slide, as you can see. He continues to serve with the 12th Pennsylvania until it becomes amalgamated with the 3rd Pennsylvania Regiment, and he serves in that regiment until the end of the war, returning to Pennsylvania in 1783 to perform quartermaster duties at Carlisle and Reading, where he was promoted captain by Brevet. Next slide. But the exploit that I'm going to talk about is something that he did while he was serving in his regiment, and it's riding with Alan McLean. So let me set the context here. In April of 1778, uh, John Armstrong was a second lieutenant at Valley Forge learning how to drill troops from a recently arrived German uh, immigrant general named von Steuben. It was at this time in April that he was chosen to augment Alan McLean's troop of Delaware 
of dragoons. Now, McLean is almost totally forgotten today, but at Valley Forge, he was serving as Washington's de facto intelligence officer. He was commanding a troop that he'd raised at his own expense of about 100 uh, infantry and cavalry, and it included a, a group of 50 Oneida Indians, of all things. Uh, McLean and his men met with informants from British-occupied Philadelphia to keep Washington apprised of what was going on there. Uh, and they were constantly engaged in actions against British foraging uh, expeditions that left the city in order to go out into the countryside and cut forage for their animals in the city. There is a, a 1783 letter from Alan McLean that states the following. Lieutenant John Armstrong was introduced to me by the generals, the Marquis de Lafayette and William Maxwell, and highly commended to me as a vigilant officer. We were in service near two months, and he merits my warmest acknowledgement for his assiduity and bravery. So the question that arises here is, how in the world could an obscure second lieutenant in a Pennsylvania regiment even meet the Marquis de Lafayette? who was serving as a major general at the time. Well, a 19th century nobleman who was only, 19 year old nobleman was, uh, had only recently joined Washington before the Battle of Brandywine in September of 1777. And he was wounded fighting alongside the brigade to which Armstrong was assigned. And perhaps the Marquis was impressed either by his performance of duty during the battle or possibly Armstrong helped him get off the battlefield after he was wounded. Now Armstrong met, had probably met Armstrong uh, that springtime before in early 1777. Washington at that time was attaching small groups of Continental soldiers to New Jersey militia units uh, that were being commanded by Maxwell, who was a New Jersey general himself. And and what has come to be known as the Foraging War. A 1783 letter from Colonel Daniel Broadhead of the 1st Pennsylvania Regiment explains how Maxwell at Valley Forge selected Washington for a special mission in which 30 men under his command defeated an enemy force several times its size. Now these two letters that I've just mentioned tend to corroborate a series of anecdotes that were published in an 1840 biography of Armstrong that was in, published from in Cincinnati, Ohio. In one action, it describes Armstrong stationing his men inside a stone wall that enclosed a cemetery while he rode alone to reconnoiter the camp of a regiment of British cavalry. He allowed himself to be seen knowing that he would be pursued by the cavalrymen and he deliberately slowed his mount to allow them to get closer, thinking that they were going to overtake him. But as he neared the graveyard, Armstrong spurred the horse and rode into the back gate of the cemetery while his men, waiting behind the stone walls, opened fire on the surprised British, inflicting many, many casualties. Now, in another action from this biography, sounds like the incident that Broadhead was describing in the letter that I referred to. In the incident, Armstrong was quoted as saying he was only badly frightened one time during his command. He was grazing his horses and resting his men in a meadow when a hundred British cavalrymen who had been riding on a hidden track in the woods burst into the meadow not far away from him. He had not enough time, he was outnumbered four to one, and he didn't have enough time to gather the horses together and mount up and ride away. So he did the only thing that he could. He formed his 30 men into two lines and told them to wait until the British were within 20 paces and to fire by platoons at them. The first platoon volley of 15 rounds disrupted the enemy advance and caused it to halt, and the second platoon volley or volley scattered them completely. His men can, continued to fire in this manner until the entire force was able to break away, mount their horses and withdraw to gallop. Now Armstrong also would have taken part with McLean 
in two other famous episodes that occurred during the revolution. The first was the Battle of Barren Hill. And that's the map that you see in the middle of your screen. That's Alan McLean on the left. And Alan McLean, you know, the, uh, the picture that's right below the map shows Alan McLean besting two British that had overtaken him in one of his uh, forays in the countryside. So he was quite a guy. But the Barren Hill battle was interesting. Uh, it's on the east side of the Skilkel River between uh, Valley Forge and Philadelphia. And before commencing his 70, 1778 campaign, summer campaign, Washington was eager to find out exactly how his troops had responded to von Steuben's training and discipline. And he also had an inexperienced major general, that's the Marquis de Lafayette again, who was still without a command. So in order to give him a little bit of experience, he gave him one third of all the readily available troops at Valley Forge, some 2,200 men, to make a reconnaissance in force of the countryside between Valley Forge and Philadelphia. Now the British also had spies at Valley Forge and they learned what was about to happen. So in the evening of 19 May, 1778, 5,000 British troops moved out of Philadelphia in two columns with the goal of seizing two fording sites on the Schuylkill River that would trap Lafayette uh, on the eastern side. Their intention was to capture and humiliate him and of course destroy or capture his badly outnumbered force. Fortunately, McLean was patrolling with his men that night and captured two British grenadiers who told him what was about to happen. McLean then ordered the remaining troops to delay the nearest British column while he rode back to inform Lafayette of the danger to his entire command, giving Lafayette barely enough time to get his troops together and march to the one ford that was still available for him to use. And he managed to cross uh, and get all of his troops across the river to include McLean's forces uh, before the British arrived and sealed the second ford. The second uh, event that McLean is famous for is something called the Michianza. And the print that's on the right side of the slide shows the Michianza. Now, Michianza is an Italian word meaning medley or mixed. And what it was referring to was a farewell ball that was given to uh, for General William Howe, who was about to depart Philadelphia to return to England. He had asked for relief from his command and was being replaced by General Henry Clinton. But he, uh, Howe was loved by his troops and so they gave him a, a fancy dress ball. McLean found out about this and wanted to disrupt it and send a message to the British that Howe can leave, but the rest of you are not going to be far behind him. So what he did is he got his men together and set fire to the wooden fortifications that connected a line of redoubts that encircled Philadelphia. And when the, when the fire started blazing and all of these uh, uh, wooden fortifications, drums along the line began to beat. Uh, all the guns in the adjacent British redoubts began firing. The British warships and transports in the Delaware River also started firing. What they were firing at is, their, is a mystery. Uh, and even the British uh, artillery in the artillery park started firing. So the ball was disrupted. Uh, and so uh, McLean had accomplished his mission of not only disrupting Howe's farewell, but frightening the loyalist population and letting them know that a change would soon come. And within uh, two or three weeks of, uh, of that time, the British evacuated Philadelphia, which was the prelude to the Battle of Monmouth. So now let's turn to the next and last Armstrong brother, Hamilton. Next slide, please. Hamilton is the most elusive of the three brothers. Uh, and the reason is uh, because so few militia records survived the revolution. Now the departure of uh, James and John from the, from the family farm placed a huge uh, burden on, uh, on, Arm on Hamilton and his father Thomas, because now they had to do, the two of them had to do the work of four grown men. And they also had to perform militia duty. By the end of 17, 
uh, 76, there were four battalions of militia that had been formed in Northumberland County, Pennsylvania. And every male between the age of 18 and 50 was required to register for one of these four battalions. And they uh, if called to, the, to duty, they were assessed a fine if they failed to report. Now, what did militia duty consist of along the frontier in the early days of the uh, revolution? Consisted of three things. Reinforcing the Continental Army when required. And this was done uh, at about the time of the first Battle of Trenton, you know, the famous uh, December crossing of the Delaware River by George Washington. Uh, he was augmented by a militia from Pennsylvania at that time. Uh, second responsibility was to guard supplies at Fort Augusta, which was a main fortification in uh, Northumberland County, uh, located near the uh, Sunbury, which is the county seat. And then the third is to defend against Indian attacks should that arise. So for the first two years of the revelation, things were all quiet on the Indian front on the frontier. But in July of 1778, 182 Connecticut settlers in the Wyoming Valley. And if you go to the next slide, please. No, oh, there. Map of Pennsylvania. If you go to the bottom of the uh, of this of the map just above where it says captain sam brady that's the susquehanna river that flows north and then flows divides at a place called Smoky, which was renamed sunbury and there's a west branch and a north branch you see wyoming is on the north branch that is only 50 miles away from the armstrong family farm which is on the west bank of the uh, susquehanna river so 182 settlers were killed and scalped by a mixed band of British, Loyalist, and Seneca and Mohawk tribesmen. This triggered the onset of nearly continuous attacks uh, on the Pennsylvania frontier by such groups until the end of the revolution. So from 1778 onward, Hamilton Armstrong becomes only a part-time farmer and a full-time militia member. And he also served in four ranger units that had been formed. Now this brings up, so what's a ranger unit? Ranger operations in, uh, in colonial America began really in the 17th century, very early on, when the first colonists realized they could not simultaneously cultivate their fields and protect themselves from hostile Indian tribes. So they developed a system of hiring local men to patrol or range a given area to provide early warning of attack, hence their name, Rangers. So Rangers lived off the land and dressed like Indians. You will notice there's a picture of a typical Ranger there on the left side of the, of the slide. So they wore close fitting caps or sometimes even handkerchiefs instead of the wide brimmed hats or the tri-colored or tri-cornered hats uh, worn by Continental Army soldiers. They wore loose fitting, uh, Clothes, uh, the color of the forest. They uh, typically wore moccasins of dressed deerskin. They carried muskets, not rifles, as popularly thought, uh, because they could be, muskets can be loaded at the run. They carried their uh, ammunition in powder horns and bullet pouches instead of paper cartridges, which is what Continental Army soldiers used, because this better protected ammunition in rainy weather or swampy terrain. Uh, they didn't use swords, they had knives and hatchets or tomahawks. And all of them almost always carried a scalping knife to use either as a weapon or to verify their kills because they mirrored Indian warfare, which was very brutal on both sides. So ranger duty required more than just woodcraft and physical endurance, it required sound judgment and discipline. If a ranger unit was discovered, and typically they were organized for six month tours and operated behind the lines, taking the war to the, to the enemy, which in this case were the tribes in Western Pennsylvania, uh, no help was expected. It was always better to retreat or run away to fight another day than to fight against overwhelming odds. So the best known ranger in Pennsylvania during the revolution was Captain Sam Brady of the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment. And so a brief exploit of what he did 
uh, is my best and only way to illustrate the kind of things that Hamilton Armstrong would have been confronting during his four periods of ranger duty. So, as I say, Brady was a regular officer in the uh, 8th Pennsylvania Regiment, which was stationed uh, far into uh, along the Allegheny River in western Pennsylvania. He was ordered in 1778 to assemble a small group to eliminate an Indian band that had been attacking settlers along the Allegheny River. So he got his eight men together, dressed them as Indians, had an Indian guide, and found and ambushed the party that outnumbered them two to one by employing a simple but very effective technique, which he used repeatedly after that. He would wait until the enemy was very close by, then his men would fire a single well-aimed volley and then charge with bayonets, yelling and screaming in their native garb. This created confusion and usually resulted in the scattering of the, the Indians that they were after. This worked so well that Brady was tasked to assemble other eight-man teams along the frontier and train them in exactly the same way. He developed a, a system of hand signaling that allowed communication without making a sound, taught them ambush techniques, and also taught them how to reload while running, a skill that required lots of practice. Patrolling between Forts McIntosh and Fort Pitt, he succeeded in rescuing two children taken in a raid by waiting until sunrise to attack an entire Indian village. Similar successes like this swelled the ranks of his ranger force as local men eagerly volunteered uh, to take the fight to the Indians who were persistently attacking all the settlements along western Pennsylvania. Now Brady's most famous exploit is something called the Great Leap over the Cuyahoga River in the summer of 1780 in western Pennsylvania. Indians had been raiding in Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, in Washington County in the western Pennsylvania, and had murdered several families along the Beaver River and taken their scalps before they returned across the Ohio River into what was then referred to as the Ohio Country. Brady was visiting the home of a friend nearby when this occurred and agreed to lead the local country's ranger company in pursuit of the Indians before they could get across the river. He overtook them at a place in Ohio known uh, subsequently as Brady's Lake for a reason that I'll just tell you in a second. He posted two thirds of his men along a trail that led into the Indian encampment. At first light, he and the other third of his men walked to the edge of the Indian camp fired one volley and then turned and ran back down the trail from which they had come with the Indians obviously in hot pursuit. When he reached the ambush site, he and his men ran straight through it, stopped, turned, and fired another volley because they had been able to reload along the way, just as the rest of his men opened fire uh, and decisively defeated the Indians who then ran away. After the, uh, the volleys and after the enca uh, encounter, all the rangers scattered according to a plan to link up at a pre-designated rally point. Brady, who had been very fortunate so far that day, had a streak of bad luck, and he was captured by an entirely separate group of Indians who took them to another Indian village uh, and tied him up, where they intended to torture him to death the following morning. Brady waited, knowing what was in store for him, until his hands were untied so that the torture could begin. And torture generally involved running a, a gauntlet where uh, Indians were uh, hacking at him with tomahawks and knives, inflicting wounds until he would collapse and then he would be tortured by fire until he died. Uh, but anyway, he, when they untied his hands, he leaped up, knocked a young Indian woman into the fire, and then ran into the thick brush and made a beeline for the Cuyahoga River, which was nearby. The Indians frantically chased him, but he was familiar with the terrain and knew a spot along the river where it was extremely narrow. So when he reached that spot, he flung himself with all of his might toward the opposite bank, which he estimated afterward to have been about 25 feet. Now it's worth noting here, before I go on further, that when the Olympic Games were restarted at the end of the 19th century, 
the first Olympic record for the long jump was less than 25 feet. So it was quite a feat on Brady's part. Uh, but as he reached the other side, a musket ball tore into his leg. Now the Indians couldn't make the leap. And so they went up and down the river trying to find a crossing place. And Brady, meanwhile, was bleeding, uh, bleeding profusely. And he ran into a nearby lake and dove into it, hiding among the rushes and rotting logs. The Indians easily picked up his trail because of the blood and followed him to where he followed him to the lake where they searched in vain because he was underwater breathing through a, a reed. He later emerged and made his way safely back to Fort McIntosh. Such was the life of a ranger in Western Pennsylvania at that time. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, George Washington made this observation in February of 1783 when it became apparent that the Treaty of Paris was going to be signed and that the British would be evacuating. It is more than probable that posterity will bestow on their labors. He's talking about the men of the Continental Army. The epithet and marks of fiction, for it will not be believed that such a force as Great Britain has employed for eight years in this country could be baffled in their plan of subjugating it by numbers infinitely less, composed of men oftentimes half starved, always in rags, without pay, and experiencing at times every species of distress which human nature is capable of undergoing. Next slide. In conclusion, I'm gonna close with three thoughts for you about the revolution. Until Vietnam, the American Revolution was the longest war in American history, eight and a half years. Secondly, the revolution is second only to the Civil War in its human cost. Fully 1% of the population of the colonies died during the war. To put this in a contemporary perspective, imagine that the war in Afghanistan had cost 3.3 million American lives. And finally, American independence was not achieved by the men who met and declared it in July of 1776. It was made possible only by the efforts of unknown, unsung heroes like the three Armstrong brothers who fought the British Army and Navy for eight long years. And it is only because of men like those that we have the country that we have today. With that, I'll uh, stop here and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dave. So uh, Jerry has the question, were any of the brothers ever wounded? That you can tell. To my knowledge, no. There's no record that they were wounded. Uh, however, uh, John Armstrong, was a member of an elite infantry unit that was formed in 1779 that stormed a fortification on the Hudson River called Stony Point. I don't know if anybody in your audience is familiar with Stony Point. He returned to his unit sometime shortly after that. And it's possible that he had indeed been wounded or injured in that, but there's no record of it that we have. As far as I know, uh, and I said, the, uh, the record about Hamilton is very unclear. There's no uh, mention in anything subsequently he did that indicated he was wounded. And James apparently was never wounded. He had a charmed life. Okay, thanks. So what did they do after the war? Anything of note? Uh, yes. Uh, chapter 14 in my book is an epilogue. And so I have about a 10 or 15 page summary of what they did after the war. I'll just give you the short version. Uh, James Armstrong went to Georgia. Now he had served in the Southern campaign where he was a well-known figure and a hero. And he settled in Georgia because Georgia was the only state that granted Revolutionary War land to uh, soldiers who were not from the state. And so he, he got some land and they probably decided to make his fortune in the South mm -hmm. since he was such a well-known figure there. Uh, later on, he, uh, 
he became and he became engaged in federal forces fighting Indians in the Okani Indian Wars in Georgia. And in uh, 1798, there was a, almost a war with France. And uh, Washington uh, was selected to be the commander in chief of that. And the goal was to raise 12 regiments of infantry. Uh, there's a letter that he wrote to uh, James McHenry, James did, to James McHenry, the Secretary of War that still exists. And he's seeking a commission, which was granted. So he became a, mid, a major in the 5th Regiment of Infantry that was formed for the war with France that never happened. Afterward, he drops out of sight. Don't know what happened to him. Uh, there was a subsequent letter that he wrote in 1810 to his brother, John. And we don't have the letter, but we have John, a copy of John's reply to him. And so what we know is as of 1810, he, uh, he was married and had children, but we don't know where he was living. He probably had moved west. Mm -hmm. West in those days was the, ter the Yazoo Territory, which uh, encompassed the states of, uh, of Alabama and Mississippi, or perhaps he went on into the Louisiana Territory, but the trail went cold. John's life after the revolution is very well known. And in fact, my wife is, uh, has just finished the book that she's planned to write, this, this retirement project that has been a morning for so many years and uh, is about to have it published. Uh, his record is very well established because, uh, as I said, his papers are in the Indiana State Historical Society. So he goes west, he fights Indians, he explores uh, up the Missouri River a small way, explores a little bit up the Wabash River. Uh, he gets court-martialed because he runs afoul of army politics, which is too long a story to get into. And he becomes a prominent settler in Ohio in Indiana and a successful merchant and a, uh, a successful militia colonel. He, uh, he does become a militia colonel. And uh, he lives until the ripe old age of, uh, I think, 65, dies in 1816. Hamilton is the most tragic of, of the brothers. Uh, Hamilton appeared to want to make his fortune on the home in, uh, in Northumberland County, and he stayed there for several years. But for some reason, he decides to join his brother John in the 1st Regiment, the 1st Regiment of the U.S. Army. He joins as a gentleman volunteer, waiting until a vacancy opens. And a vacancy finally does open, and he becomes a, uh, an ensign and then a lieutenant and finally a captain. He fights at the Battle of Fallen Timbers under Major General Anthony Wayne, uh, the, the battle that broke the back of the Indian Confederation in the Northwest Territory as a battalion commander. But uh, unfortunately, he succumbs to alcoholism and he dies a very, very tragic and inglorious death, basically strangling on his own vomit in a drunken stupor. A very sad way for a great man like him to end. So those are the, briefly the stories of the three brothers. Got it. Roy F. Hickston want, would want to mention to your wife's book, and, and you mentioned it's going to be published. Uh, do you have any details on that? When or, or what's the publisher? Well, she's, uh, she submitted the manuscript at this point, and uh, in the publishing world, nothing happens overnight. You probably are aware of that. Uh, so the next step will be to get the galley proofs and then work through it till, till we get a galley that she's satisfied with. And then after that, uh, it goes pretty fast. I would estimate that the book will probably be available probably by the end of March. Got it. Okay, Dave. Uh, Dana Chipman has a question about the brothers, and were there any other brothers? I mean, you know, you're, they're settled in an area that, if you think about it, during the French and Indian War actually had a lot of action going on, and that was very familiar territory in that war. Uh, they were born right around then, uh, but, but, you know, who was helping Dad while they were out uh, fighting in, on the range? Well, Hamilton stayed home for a while, mm -hmm. and the way that worked is people when the, uh, after the Wyoming Valley Massacre of 1788, everybody that lived along the West Branch of the Susquehanna River uh, forted up, the term is forting up. That is uh, four or five or 10 families would go together and they would fortify one of their homesteads and everybody would live there. And then they would go out and work the fields as a group 
We have half of them standing guard and half of them working the fields. And then, of course, I mentioned, you know, there's all of this periods of required uh, militia duty. Now, there were two sisters. There were two uh, younger sisters. And then there was an older sister who married a man in, uh, from Hunterdon County, New Jersey, who moved west with the Armstrong family. The Armstrongs really start uh, when they come to this country in about 1754. Instead of going west, they go north and settle in Huntington County, Hunterdon County, New Jersey. And they stayed there for a few years until they go west. Because all the Scots-Irish Presbyterians, you know, of which uh, there are a huge number uh, in the revolutionary period, all went west. As one historian said, you know, like flowers seeking the sun, they moved inexorably west. And so they went west to make their, uh, uh, to make their fortune. So you had, you had the older sister and her husband that was with them at the beginning, and they stayed there. And they had a large family. So there were a lot of people in that family that helped out on the family farm. And then there were two other girls, younger girls than Hamilton, that were born of the, uh, the second marriage of Thomas Armstrong, and they grew up. And so they would have been able to do a little bit of work along the farm because, so you had basically Thomas, his wife, and two female children, fully grown children by this time, plus Hamilton for a little bit of the time. So it was enough to get them through, although it was probably a pretty difficult time because Really, the frontier was under attack for five years, from 1778 clear through the end of the revolution. So I think it was James who was captured. And so Stephen Cloak has a question. Was he, where was he kept? Where was he held? Was that just a local capture? Was he sent to a prison ship? Were there POW camps? Do you have any, any idea there? It was only for a short time, it seemed like, from over the Christmas winter quarters. Yeah, well, the, uh, the subject of prisoners during the American Revolution is an interesting one, and I'll just make a general comment about that. Uh, I told you that, you know, 1% of the population died. More, more Continental Army soldiers died in British prisons than were killed in battle. In fact, uh, a substantial amount. Nobody knows exactly how many. Uh, 2,000 Continental Army soldiers were captured at Fort Washington in 1770 six during the New York City campaign. Within four months of their capture, three quarters of them had died of starvation because the British treated them badly. So let's talk about James. James was a well-known figure. Everybody knew who he was. Uh, he was captured in an ambush that was laid for him because he was an impetuous guy. I think my vignette brought that out. Uh, and so uh, he was lured by the same trick that he had often performed himself. Uh, so he was riding and he was ambushed by a cavalry troop of loyalists that were waiting for him. And he immediately asked for quarter and it was immediately granted because they knew who he was. He was deliberately captured. And so he was uh, safely returned uh, into Charleston. Uh, and he spent a small amount of time on a prison ship in Charleston Harbor. And it's a very interesting anecdote because the, uh, the British allowed uh, Lee to send a servant to bring Armstrong's clothing and goods to him so that he would be comfortable in, uh, in his uh, imprisonment. And uh, the, uh, it was a, a corporal. And the corporal went aboard the ship and he was immediately clapped into prison himself. And he heard Armstrong walking down the hall, of, or not the hall on the deck of the ship talking loudly with some British officers and they were having a good time. And so he yells out, hey, Captain Armstrong, is it you who are supposed to be in prison or is it me? <laughs> and then it was all settled and he was exchanged two months later. Officers had it much better. Officers easily got exchanged. Enlisted men rarely got exchanged. Thanks. And uh, let's see, last question we have is uh, Albert Angel mentions or asks, you know, can we order a copy of your book? Is there any way to pick up a signed copy or get it in a plate or anything like that? A lot of our authors do that. Well, I'm a local guy, and I'm happy to come to the club and sign anybody's books if you'd like. Uh, as I say, the probably the fastest way to get a copy uh, is to order from Amazon. Uh, I've had better luck with, uh, with deliveries on Amazon than any other service, uh, so I'll give them a plug. 
but uh, if you would like to arrange something, uh, if you could set up a time for members to come to the club, sure. I'd be happy to come and sign. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a local guy. You can see behind me that I live in the Mount Vernon area of Northern Virginia, so I'm easily available. You got a lot more snow there right now, though. We have a lot more snow. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I moved north to see a little more. I'm not, I got a dusting out there. It's still scenic. But so, so what I'll do, if anybody, any of the listeners are interested of, uh, to getting David's, Dave's book, uh, if you don't mind, reach out to Chandler and, and they can set up a time or they'll show, I'll let her be the go between uh, to work a time out when David can come in and sign up. You can either leave him there probably, uh, pick up at the desk or something like that. That's an option, uh, option there. So if you're interested in that. If I, if I could just if I could just make sure. one final comment, it would it would be a very great. I'm familiar with the library that you have in the Army Navy Club, and it would be a great honor for me to have a book in that library. Sure, so right. anyway. that's usually easy. That's usually the first thing we do if if you're at a book forum and press person. We have the the author sign one, and it's usually set up there. Our will our new librarian is real keen on on building it up and 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 uh, if you haven't been there lately he's tidied it up he's reorganized it he's got a whole new uh, uh system going on there so he's really made a big difference so if you haven't been for the to the club a while take a gander up there introduce yourself to will uh he's he's well, he's been there now about two years of course a lot of it's been in the covid time so uh we'll go like that but uh he's trying to make a big difference up there uh, yeah, I, I suggest you're probably right. If, if Chandler will just let me know if any members want to have their books signed and just want to leave them with her, then uh, I can arrange a time to come in and, and do several at once or come in anytime. I'm always happy to get out of the house. <laughs> sure. Well, that's probably, that's probably the easiest. So, uh, so, so Dave, any, any last comments, thoughts uh, before we wrap this up? We're out of questions right now. I really appreciate the, the audience throwing in questions like that. Uh, uh, it's just a very great honor to be able to address the members of the Fox Connor Society and the, the Army Navy Club. As I say, I have a, a long history with you guys, and it was certainly a pleasure to be with you tonight. Well, Dave, thank you very much, really. This kicks off a great, a great we we're hoping to be a, a little more clearer year. Uh, we have a few more events coming up. Uh, we'll have quite a few events. We've got a great year coming up, and a lot of Revolutionary War topics uh, coming up, uh, both online only. Uh, I've got a couple of webinars. I actually have uh, uh, John Furlan is coming up uh, it's probably in the next few months. Uh, he's not coming to the club. Uh, he's, he's, he's getting out of age. He would prefer that uh, we just do this, this book online. So it's going to be a webinar. I expect to see John Furlan. If you're not familiar with him. Uh, oh, I'm very familiar with his work. He's winning independence. Uh, but we, no, I finally got no, that that's would one be, thing That would be a treat for everybody. Well, that's one thing that's that's doing these webinars has really opened up. I mean, we started by recording them, uh, doing some pseudo podcasts, but this has really brought it in. It's allowed us to uh, to bring in authors that's usually out of our reach, uh, either because we don't they don't bring them here. And so, uh, in any case, um, thank you very much, David. Thanks everyone for participating. Welcome to uh, 2022, and hope to see you at the club soon. Uh, our next session at the club, if you want to say hello to me, is going to be on the 18th of January. Uh, where we have the book uh, Eagle Down by Jessica Donati. So, uh, David, again, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and uh, and good luck on your on the on your book, The Armstrong Brothers. My pleasure. We'll see you. See you, everyone. Thank you.